And again, I don't want to uh, turn this into a, a boring or a dragged out kind of uh, list of just names and dates. I really want this to be practical. I really want us to see how the church has often fought battles through the years and has seen God work in tremendous ways. And we are, in a sense, making church history right now. And God is still at work. The God of these early believers is the God that we serve. And though we may be in a different century with newer technology and lots of amenities, we are faced with a lot of, a lot of the same temptations. We're still battling uh, error and false teaching. We're dealing with a culture that is more and more anti-God, anti-Bible. And so the early church is dealing with persecution. The early church is dealing with false teaching. The early church is trying to figure out how to uh, stay separate from the world and yet still reach the world with the gospel. So we're going we're gonna to come back and we will pick up where Constantine defeated Galerius. And this is in the uh, Roman Empire in battling between co-emperors and emperors and Galerius trying to dominate. And Constantine defeats Galerius. So then Constantine steps in as emperor, and then his co-emperor, Licinius, together they issue the Edict of Milan, or Milan. Galerius, on his deathbed, made a proclamation that there should be a reduction of persecution against Christians. There's an Eastern Roman Empire, there's a Western Roman Empire. There's co-emperors, and now... Constantine, and at the end of Galerius' life, there's a desire to have a reduction in persecution of the Christians in hopes that that will bring the empires together. There will be more unity. So Constantine, I know he is considered in some circles, and you probably through the years have heard things about Constantine maybe being a true believer. I don't believe that Constantine was a true believer. I, I don't believe that Constantine, when he saw the sign in the sky and he put the sign on his, uh, the shields of his army, I, I don't think that Constantine was truly in faith and repentance, trusting Jesus Christ as his Savior. There's reason to believe that, on, that Constantine was actually praying to the sun god of the Roman Empire and eventually... There are things that make us believe that he even equated Jesus with this sun god. But in God's providence, we see the Edict of Milan, AD 313, to allow Christians and all others to worship as they desire so that whatever divinity lives in the heavens will be kind to us. Now think about that. That's a fairly ecumenical statement, isn't it? <laughs> maybe this Jesus, maybe this God that the Christians worship, maybe he can bestow some favor on us so that we can have more political success, more military success, we can have a united empire. We see this blending of civil and church authority. We see this more and more. Again, they did not understand separation of church and state the way we do. We're looking back through what, almost 250 years now in America? And can we just, can I just say without any kind of bragging, but it, 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 it's, it's the Baptists that really made this a point of emphasis in the early days of our country, that there be a separation of church and state. Roger Williams had his issues, but one thing he got right was we did not need a state church. And the Baptists were tremendously influential in understanding the priesthood of the believer in Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, under God that which is God's. Okay? So there's a lot of criticism and just criticism of Baptists. I get that. Okay? And we're not the only ones going to heaven. I realize that. But we can be thankful for our Baptist heritage that there was a emphasis on the separation of church and state. We are getting really close here in America with some of the things that we're seeing. We're getting really close to an upsetting of religious liberty, and there's already, with the Title IX changes, and with the LGBT cult 
religion, and with climate religion, I use that word religion on purpose, okay, because it's becoming, it's acting in, there's a belief system and there's an application that is religious. They don't call it that, but that's what we're seeing, that kind of emphasis, and we've tried in the past to make some sort of changes in our culture for Christ, for God, for morality, through groups who meant well, like the moral majority, but did certain forms of political legislation change the hearts of people? And I think that's what sometimes we get mixed up about. We think that, not that we, every piece of legislation legislates some form of morality. We realize that, right? There is, in every policy, in every rule, in every regulation, in every piece of legislation, there is some morality that is being impressed upon the people. But that does not change the hearts. Political authority does not change the hearts. Hank? The Ten Commandments, yes. Right, exactly. Good point. Yes. So here we are seeing this, thankfully, a reduction in persecution, but a blending of civil and church authority. He wanted Christianity to help unite his empire, begin granting church leaders special favors, leading to greater power among certain priests, bishops, overseers. So the Donatist controversy got strong. The Donatists were those who wanted some strict regulations about who would be welcomed back into the church because during persecution there had been some professing Christians who had signed a certificate recanting their faith, saying they had worshipped a false god. The Donatists were saying we need to be very strict about who we welcome back into the church and if a pastor, overseer, bishop, church leader had signed one of those sacrifice certificates saying that he had worshipped a false god in order to avoid persecution, imprisonment, execution, whatever. The Donatists were saying that church leader has disqualified himself from the ministry. And they were even, some of them were even so strict as to say all of his previous official rulings or, you know, uh, ordinations and uh, officiations of marriages, funerals, whatever, those would no longer be applicable. I mean, there were some who were that strict about this. Now, I believe that they were right about a man who was a church leader who signed a sacrifice certificate who said, even if he was lying to make amends in order to avoid persecution, we saw that with the USSR. We saw preachers with the USSR when the communists took over. There were pastors who said, oh, okay, we'll do whatever the communists, whatever, what, what was... The USSR was the CCP or whatever they were called. The Soviets, yeah, thank you, Soviets. They were, there were pastors who were saying, whatever the Soviets tell us that we can or cannot do in our church, whatever we can preach or not preach, there were pastors who were trying to follow the Soviet rules for church. And eventually, what happened to them? They even got clamped down on. And... So we see some of that going on. We see some of these, well, to avoid persecution, we'll at least sign off on this certificate, we'll lie, or maybe actually participate in order to avoid persecution. Now the Donatists are saying, well, that pastor, that church leader, he's disqualified himself. And I, and I have to agree with them. Well, this was a controversy in the church. You can see why. How do we let people back into the church? There were those who said there needs to be an outward clear expression of sorrow, repentance. There needs to be an obvious change. There were some who were saying, nope, nada, can't. I mean, you can see how it could be a, a church issue. But when it got really strong, yeah, I did have it up on the screen. When the Donatist controversy got really strong, Constantine intervened and made an official decree that essentially led to a state church, and we see the earliest days of the Roman Catholic system coming into place. The Donatist controversy was a church matter. The Donatists in that controversy led the church to call out to Caesar and say, help us solve our problem. Wait a second here. Do we not see a problem with that? 
I am not going to Joe Biden to get help on how to run the church. It's not my church in the first place. It's God's church. And the Bible tells us how his church is to operate. And I know some good people can disagree on some of the church policy and even some of the uh, secondary doctrines and applications of certain doctrines. Okay, but we don't go to the government. We don't look to Caesar for how to operate the church, for how the church should function. So you can see the real problem here, all right? So can I say another thing? I'm going to get on a little bit of rabbit trail. Can I say another thing? I don't, I, I don't have a problem with praying for our politicians. I don't have a problem with even having a special day to recognize. But I am not going to put a politician in the pulpit of our church for all of us to sing his or her praises, for them to make a political speech. For one thing, I know there's the whole tax-exempt stuff. Without even considering all that, I just think that it's a dangerous blurring of the lines of the church's authority in politics. We are to be active citizens, voting, getting involved in school boards and various councils, and some of you are involved in some of those things, and praise God for that. We need to be active, especially in a constitutional democratic republic that is quickly losing its freedom to exercise our, isn't it, isn't it somewhere, isn't it in our founding documents that it's to be of the people, by the people, for the people, instead of for a political party, by a political party, right? <laughs> anyway, so we are to be involved and we are to be active. And thank God for Christian people. We are down in Greenville, South Carolina, and there is a strong, conservative Christian man running for U.S. Rep representative in the district down there in Greenville. Praise God for, for him. We need Christians in education. We need Christians in all kinds of areas. But we are not to blur that line between Caesar's authority and church authority. And I see churches bringing in, can I just say, sometimes just rank, liberal, God-denying, Bible-hating, sin-loving politicians and putting them in their pulpit and treating them as if they are heroes and heroines and some sort of authority on church matters, on the Word of God. That is shameful. And, of course, those churches don't lose any tax-exempt status, do they? Isn't it? it depends on what party. It depends on where you're at on the, the spectrum. But that's another, another issue. My desire is not to put politicians in the pulpit and parade them around and be a political church. Am I wanting to be involved? Am I planning to vote on Tuesday? Yes. Do I believe we should be involved in civil authority and issues um, as respective citizens? Yes. But there's, there's obviously a line, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, unto God that which is God's. And Jesus said, I will build my church. So Arius, here we go. Early stages of Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism. Arian. Arius, excuse me, Arius was a church leader in Alexandria, Egypt, taught that Jesus was not divine, but the first created being. Dangerous. This is a major doctrine that for probably 250, 300 years the church is going to wrestle with. How do we state succinctly, clearly the doctrine of the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One essence, three persons. How do we say that? How do we define that? How do we declare that? How do we teach that? Is that not an important doctrine? If Jesus is not 100% God and 100% man, that literally goes to the heart of the gospel. That literally calls Jesus a liar, that he's not who he says he is. That goes to the inspiration, the authority, and the infallibility of God's word. The church was wrestling with this doctrine. Arius comes along and he is saying, no, Jesus was not divine. He was the first created being. And we see the early days of what is now Jehovah's Witness 
even Mormonism. One of the reasons that I am so strong about John 3.16 and the word begotten is because of this doctrine. There are modern versions who they will say one and only. I really like a version of the Bible that's going to use the word begotten because I think it is a unique, in the Greek language, it's monogenes, the unique one and only son of God. This word begotten is the word that was settled on in the early days of the church because it was a uniquely distinct way of saying that Jesus is not a created being. He is one with the Father, eternal, and fully God. <laughs> and so it's important that we use good, distinct, and appropriate and accurate language when dealing with, with doctrine. Constantine called for the leading church overseers. Again, we see too much involvement by Caesar. Constantine is doing a political uh, operation to try to keep unity in the church and the empire, I should say. He brought in 2,000 additional elders and deacons. This is the Council of Nicaea. They tried to settle the Arian controversy, keep unity within the empire. Alexander of Alexandria was the chief opponent of Arius. We're thankful for and Alexander, who stood up for the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, stood for the truth of the Word of God. And in that Council of Nicaea, the council adopted a statement in keeping with biblical teaching. Arius and his followers were denied official church recognition and fellowship. There's the Council of Nicaea. There's their statement. I won't read it in its entirety, but we're thankful for that statement on the divinity of Jesus. The problem, as we can see, is what? What do we see? And once again, what do we see as a, a problem here? Who is, what's that? In yeah, we're, we're seeing way too much involvement of Constantine in the Roman Empire in a church matter. At the same time, do we appreciate the fact that Constantine, instead of persecuting and killing Christians, was at least trying to find some agreement? Yes, okay. We're thankful for that, but at the same time, we're concerned because we're seeing too much civil authority here. I did not put it up on the screen. Sorry, I'm working, I'm talking too fast and not putting things up on the screen. But that's the, the statement that the Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, agreed to, and it's a, it's a good statement. It's a great statement. We're thankful for it. So that brings us to 327. Now we're dealing with uh, Athenaeus. Uh, Athanasius and uh, some other uh, dates here in the 4th century. AD 327, Constantine shows his true colors, doesn't he? He tries to allow Arius to become part of the recognized church in order to appease him and his followers and unite the empire. So once again, Arius is stirring up trouble. He's trying to form congregations. He's still teaching, and he won't go away. And so Constantine is still trying to figure out a way to bring these groups together. He allows Arius to, or tried to allow Arius to become part of the recognized church. Thankful for Athanasius. He was, as a child, serving the hermits, which the word monk literally means alone. He was out in the desert serving them. He was later ordained as a pastor. Literally, he was brought in as overseer of the church in the city of Alexandria after the previous pastor died. He refused to endorse Arius as an official church member due to his false teaching and was outspoken about it. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for Athanasius and for his stand for the truth of God's word. But once again, what does Constantine do? He gets involved and he banishes Athanasius, charges him with treason until Constantine died in AD 337. 362, Athanasius returns to Alexandria Julian is now the empire, emperor, but Julian was a pagan king, hated Christians, because Constantine, a, again, a false Christian, had most of his family murdered for political and power-grabbing reasons. So, Julian is now the emperor, but he doesn't like Constantine because Constantine, in a power grab, had some of Julian's family murdered. Constantine's not a good Christian. He's not a Christian. He's a political expedient, someone who uses Christ's name 
for political advantage and expediency. Do we not see people doing that to this day? I get disgusted with politicians who pander to evangelicals when you really look deep into their life and you say, hmm, we better be a little leery here. We might be thankful for some policies, might be thankful for some people that they bring alongside, but there's some pandering here that I'm not so sure it's really authentic. And then sometimes, many times, what happens? A few years down the road, political winds change. Oh, the evangelical church is not, uh, the evangelicals, that, that conservative Christian vote, is, that's not as important as trying to be the centrist or whatever, <laughs> moderate, whatever term. And it was never really about honoring Christ. It was never really about upholding the word of God. It was really about me and my political power. And Constantine literally was a murderous emperor, which was not uncommon for Roman emperors. That's what they did. Are we not concerned in America about the way that our Department of Justice, what is it called, lawfare, are we not concerned? Because this is the way that the world used to operate. The American experiment changed a lot of that by the grace of God. And now we're returning? Well, why are we returning to this kind of nonsense where we take political enemies and we throw them in prison and we murder them and we become a banana republic as most of the world has done for centuries? Why was America different? Why? Because of godly, because of biblical principles. It wasn't because we flipped a coin in the sky and said, oh, it might be better. If no, it was because there was a change that Christianity brought. There was a respect for biblical principles that said, we're going to do things differently. We're not just going to keep changing monarchs and slaying all the previous family and doing political hit jobs. But we're losing that quickly, aren't we? And it comes back down to we don't believe the word of God and we don't trust the word of God and we are going to do things our way. And so we're going to be bloodthirsty for power. We're going to get it however we can. And if we have to pander to the evangelicals a little bit, if we have to kind of kiss up to the LGBT crowd a little bit, if we have to find what, what happens, it becomes a whole bunch of just compromise, morally, spiritually. And then the church wants to be governed in detailed, minute regulation and depend upon civil authority for operating the church? God, big problems here. Constantine is not really a good guy. He's looking for political power and power grabbing. He's executed some of Julian's family. He's using even false religion, Arius, and trying to unite the empire. He banishes Athanasius. Athanasius returns to Alexandria. And then Julius finally realizes that it would not be politically expedient to persecute Christians. We are thankful that he did not. He did reduce political favors. And actually, that was a benefit to the church because the church, some in the church, in the true church, began to realize that we should not be depending on civil authority. And we should be depending more on biblical authority. So that was a good thing, okay? But we still have this early stages of the Roman Catholic Church forming because there's still a group who wants civil authority and church authority blended. Athanasius called for a synod of church leaders to affirm the Nicene Creed, which we looked at on the previous slide. Questions so far or comments? Okay. So, monks and monasteries. I think there's a lot of, I don't know, I don't know if it's Hollywood, TV programs, legend, <laughs> mythology, I don't know. There's a lot of misunderstanding about monks and monasteries. Um, we see now that there are some who are leery of the empirical influence on the church, rightly so. Okay? So, too much authority in the hands of bishops and overseers who are blending with civil authority and trying to use civil authority to orchestrate, intervene, influence, solve church issues, etc. So what do they do? 
You have some who then go to the other extreme. We don't want all this civil authority. We don't want all this blending of church and civil authority. So we're just going to go find a place in the desert, find a cave, and we're going to just completely isolate ourselves from society. And we're going to be monks. And we're going to form monasteries and convents. Okay? At, at some level, we appreciate that. But aren't we constantly trying to figure out this balance in the world but not of the world? Would there, would there not be, for many of us, a desire to just go find a cave somewhere and light our candle at night and have our MREs and just forget about this world? But what have we been called to do? Did Jesus tell the disciples when he sent out the 70, when he sent out the apostles, did he say, go find a cave and go on top of the rock of the mountain and speak as loud as you can, then go back and hide again? What did Paul do in his evangelism in the book of Acts? He's in the synagogues. He's in the marketplaces. He's on Mars Hill. That's hard. It's hard for us to go into our workplaces, our places of entertainment, our neighbors, the people we interact with on a week. It's hard. Some of you are in classrooms where you are dealing with groups of people around you, places of work and training where they look at you like you were an alien life form because you go to church. You don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You don't cuss. You, you, you actually have integrity. You're not trying to manipulate and lie and cheat and deceive and Constantly trying to figure out a way to get up on, get ahead of somebody by undermining them. I mean, on and on it goes, right? And it's, it, gets, it gets hard. I remember going to Kenya on my first mission trip, and there was a mentality that they said the missionaries have been trying to get away from because for many, many, many years, with all good intentions, there was this compound philosophy. You go as a missionary and you isolate yourself on a compound and then you kind of go out during the day and you do a little bit of business and reach people and evangelize and you come back and you hide in your compound. And missionaries began to realize that that's great for preaching the gospel and bringing people into church, but there had to be more going out into the highways and the byways and among the hedges and the bushes and reaching people where they were at and evangelizing in that way instead of just venturing out in, from a compound and coming back. And I understand there is security, okay? I remember being, and the missionary is describing, in the entire neighborhood, everybody knew where the Mzungu lived. So everybody knew Mzungu was the white man, all right? And I forget which missionary was here and talked about, I think it was... Um, uh, the Bufords uh, talked about the Mzungu. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know. I remember that word. I would walk down the, from the missionary's house to the church, and I'd walk across the field, and there, all the little kids would be like, Mzungu, Mzungu. <laughs> and then they loved when I played basketball and I had shorts. They would love to come up, and they would rub the hair on my legs. I have very hairy legs. Sorry, too much information. I have very hairy legs. And they would love, as I would sit on the sidelines after playing basketball, they'd love to just rub my legs because they hardly had any hair because they didn't have much protein in their diet. And uh, they just thought my, my, my legs were the, the neatest thing. That they're like. And I, I, have a little bit of, I have a little bit of social, um, what's the right word? Uh, I can't think of the right word now. I like, I like my social space. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> social awkwardness? <laughs> I forget. Who said that? All right. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. No. Um, I have a little bit of a social bubble, and, and God's helped me with that tremendously. I have a little bit of a social bubble. And this is one of the ways that God really worked on me is because I had African kids coming up rubbing my hair on my legs. What am I going to do? Get mad at them? God was teaching me. You've got to give up your social bubble a little bit to reach these people. And then we got on a matatu, and there was... 25 people on a 12-passenger van. I'm exaggerating a little bit. And most of them didn't have a bath for the last week. And the rock music was blaring at the highest levels. And the missionary did it on purpose. He put me and another kid on this, on this matatu on purpose. And he got off and he said, 
later, he said, you know why I did that? I was like, yes, I know. <laughs> so God was breaking down even my own pride with my own social bubble. All that being said, we are constantly trying to figure out, right, that balance in the world, not of the world. Boy, we, I mean, we ought to do tavern and bar evangelism, shouldn't we? We ought to be going to the bars and to the taverns and nightclubs, and we ought to be jamming with them and then reaching them with the gospel, right? That's a, <laughs> but now we see that coming into the church, right? And then, <laughs> and then there's the other extreme where it's just us four and no more. We never venture out any further than this. And we, we constantly, we're constantly dealing with that. And if you don't believe exactly the way I do in every area, all the way down to the thousandth percent, then I want nothing to do with you. Spit on you, walk away. I'm the only one that's spiritual. I mean, we, we are fighting that constantly. They were fighting it in the early days of the church. This civil authority and, and church authority is going way too far, so let's go find a cave somewhere. And let's just meditate, stare at our navel. I know, okay. Some of that was good. There was some scholarly Bible study, intensive theological studies that we are still benefiting from, that we're thankful for. But there is this struggle between how much do we be in the world but not of the world in Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And yet still, go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come. We're constantly dealing with that. Jerome, I'm sorry, monks and nuns. Um, nuns is just a feminine form of monk. Uh, I think it's in a Latin uh, dialect. They form monasteries, convents, which just means gathering places. Jerome. Jerome was a conflicted monk, struggled with purpose in life, painful pagan memories. He returned to Rome, given a project by the overseer to translate the Bible into Latin from the original languages. He and Marcella were friends. She financed the project, and Jerome finished his translation in A.D. 405. Jerome was criticized because he wanted to translate the Bible into Latin from the original languages. They wanted him to just take the Septuagint and use the Greek translation of the Old Testament and then translate from that. He went back and he went to the original Hebrew, the manuscripts that he had available to him, and to the New Testament manuscripts, and he translated the Bible from the original languages into Latin. And roughly a thousand years, I realized that the Catholic Church hijacked in a lot of ways, hijacked that particular version. But it was the standard Bible, in a sense, for roughly a thousand years. But why did it get the name Vulgate? Anybody know why? Vulgar. Yeah, it was used, yeah, the common language. It was the vulgar. It was not the highfalutin, you know. And so it was called, it got, got to, to be known as uh, the Vulgate. All right. Questions or comments so far? So there's a society on campus um, called Basel. Um, society is like a sorority or a fraternity. They don't have sororities or fraternities at Bob Jones. They, have, they call them societies. There's girl societies and boy societies, men and women's. And there was a society called Basel. And when I was a student there, I couldn't stand Basel except for a couple of guys. And they were our chief rival in basketball and soccer. Every time we got to the semifinals, it seemed like we had to play Basel, and we would almost always lose to them in the semifinals. I don't know what Basel's reputation is today, but Basel was a good guy, <laughs> okay? I don't know about I mean, all the reputations of societies and all that, but Basel, the actual man, Basel, was a good guy. His sister, Macrina, brother Gregory of Nyssa, close friend Gregory of... Nazianzia, or Nazianus, I can't pronounce it, were strong proponents of the Nicene Creed from the region of Cappadocia in modern Turkey. We have to be greatly appreciative of the great Cappadocians. They were trying to find that place between the blending of civil and church authority 
and the monk cave-like mentality. They were trying to find the right place and stay firm and true to biblical teaching, particularly the Nicene Creed and the divinity of Jesus, the proper teaching of the Trinity. We have a lot to be thankful for these people right here because they really preached and taught and formed communities. We would even say some of the early church gatherings that we now have so frequently and sadly more and more Christians are getting away from church period there, there's statistics coming out now that there's only 30 percent I can't remember if it's 30 percent of professing or if it's just 30 percent of the population that even goes to church and I forget what the statistics are if it's one time a month or twice a month it's a really low standard it's sad the Cappadocians, they, for one thing, stood strongly and firmly upon the Nicene Creed, preaching and teaching the foundational truths, particularly in regards to the Trinity. But they also had community, Christian community. Yes, there were monasteries and convents, but they were bringing a Christian community together that was trying to find that proper balance between going into isolation and asceticism Versus the other extreme of civil and church authority. And their communities were places where Christians would come and they would work. And they would serve. And they were under the preaching and teaching of God's word. And what were they frequently preaching and teaching? The Trinity. The Nicene Creed. The authority of God's word. Jesus Christ is God. We are much in gratitude and indebted uh, to them. Uh, Basil argued for the correct understanding and interpretation of the terms essence and person. Essence is the attributes of God. Person defines the distinctions. He was the first theologian to write a major treatise on the Holy Spirit in which he offered proofs for the deity of the Holy Spirit. Even our understanding of the Holy Spirit, a lot of it goes back to Basil's writings and teachings regarding the Holy Spirit. I was taught in both undergrad and in seminary in systematic theology. I was taught God is one essence, three persons. Those terms go all the way back to the fourth century, to Basil and his fellow Cappadocians. Um, he argued that any difference in the Godhead is in the internal relations and functions of each person within the Trinity. Eternal love and communion exist between the persons of the Trinity. The Father ordains and orchestrates, the Son redeems, the Spirit seals. So, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three Fully, 100%, completely God. One essence, three persons. What was Arius teaching? Jesus Christ is what? A created being. Firstborn. So then what is that, how does that application then get made for us everyday people? If Jesus Christ is just a created being, then what does that mean in Mormonism? You too can achieve what Jesus achieved. And you can populate a planet somewhere. And it's a very male-centered type of false religion. What do Jehovah's Witnesses teach about eternity, about salvation? Good works, keeping a set of rules. Jesus was, what, just a good example? Okay? They were already arguing against that. They were already strongly opposed to the Arian false teaching. They were standing for the truth of God's word and defining in distinct doctrinal terms. And we are thankful for their influence upon the church. While Christians suffered less, had numerical growth, the blending of civil authority and church authority was a problem. So was extreme asceticism. I can't pronounce it again. As in every generation, there are doctrinal controversies that we must speak up about and stand up for the truth of the word of God.
So that moves us into the next era of church history. Five important events. This is now going to cover 376 roughly to 664 AD. You have the first council of Constantinople, 381. You have Emperor Theodosius declaring Christianity the official religion of the empire, 391. The Council of Ephesus in 431. And this is the church's third general council. It accused Nestorius of teaching that Jesus was two separate persons, one human, one divine. Council of Chalcedon, 451. At the church's fourth general council, more than 500 overseers condemned the one nature, monophysite view of Christ. They agreed that according to scripture, Christ was one person with two natures, one human, one divine. This became known as the two nature or diophysite view. And then the second council of Constantinople, 553. One nature theology became popular again. Justinian convened the church's fifth general council to end the controversy. The council denounced the three chapters, the writing of the three Nestorians. The council also declared that Jesus' mother the council also declared that Jesus' mother remained a virgin throughout her life. Obviously, that was a Catholic teaching that is still held to this day. Big problem. Okay? So that's a general overview of some important dates. Now, number four, the Council of Chalcedon. We don't have much time today, so we won't get very far. But what we now refer to in this particular doctrinal teaching is what's called the hypostatic union the miraculous union of the divine nature and the human nature in Jesus Christ. Theologians often refer to it as the hypostatic union. But you can see where the church is already in the 4th century, 5th century, trying to figure out how to teach this and what is the proper scriptural understanding. And so you have a, a Nestorian uh, teaching that says Jesus was two separate persons, one human, one divine. And then Council of Chalcedon, and then the Second Council of Constantinople. All these are dealing with these issues. I keep putting the wrong number at the top. I apologize. It, it varies. Sometimes it's 7, 8, sometimes 10. And I keep forgetting to change the title at the top. Sorry about that. You have Pelagius, Theodore, Augustine, Benedict, Columba, Gregory, and Augustine. I wish we had time to talk about all of these. We won't have, I'm just introducing them today. Uh, Pelagius was a monk who taught that humans have the natural ability to please God. So basically he denies what? Sinful nature of man. Do you know Pelagianism is in The Sound of Music? What was uh, Julie Andrews singing? Why, is, why were good things happening to her? What's that? Yeah, she must have done something in her childhood. What, that's Pelagianism. So everything is about, in a sense, can I use the word karma? I, I can create good karma in my childhood that will result in good karma for me as an adult. <laughs> Do we not see danger in that thinking? But Pelagianism, at the, at the bottom line, his error was he denied the depravity of man, the sinful human nature. Okay, so good things happen to you later in life because you create that destiny. And now we see that in some of this word faith. I speak my destiny into existence. I speak and it becomes reality. Okay, I mean this, this kind of stuff, it just keeps repackaging itself. Um, and then we'll, we'll conclude here, these names and then these terms. And I have, it's, it's five, I apologize. I'm working in the, in the um, hotel on Friday afternoon. I had a little break between packing and loading and, and driving. I had a break and I was in the, the hotel and I can't count, sorry. It's actually five. <laughs> you have the general council, one of the seven councils acknowledged by the Eastern and Western Christians. Apollinarianism, the belief that Jesus had no human mind. Theotokos, a Greek word meaning God-bearer. Many Christians called Jesus' mother Theotokos. Nestorius criticized the term, arguing that Mary didn't bear only a divine being. Mary bore the Lord Jesus Christ, who is fully human and fully divine. So where does, what does, 
what does Theotokos eventually lead to? From my understanding, it leads to the idea uh, that Jesus was, or excuse me, that Mary was a perpetual virgin because she bore uh, the Son of God. Nestorianism, belief that Jesus was two separate persons, one human, one divine. Nestorius was probably unfairly accused of teaching this view, and it's more properly termed hyperdiophysitism, but you can see why that would be a hard thing to say, so they just call it Nestorianism. <laughs> Uh, monophysitism from the Greek monophysis, one nature, the belief that Jesus' is divine nature fully absorbed as human nature, also called uh, Eutychianism after an early proponent. All that being said, the early church for several centuries here is working, teaching, proclaiming, defining on this doctrine of the divinity of, the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity. This is huge. This is a major controversy in the church. And they are trying to be biblical, scriptural. Do we not find ourselves dealing with some of these same errors in the culture today? And we can be thankful for some of these who have gone before us who helped fight these battles early on and prepare the way. Any questions or comments as we close? No? Okay. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this a lesson. Thank you for the providence of God throughout history as Christ builds his church. Thank you for this place that you've called us to. May we be faithful in it to continue to stand for the truth of the word of God and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So thank you for being here. We'll start the service at 1045. Should be five. You stopped at four. Oh, did I not put the... Oh, I didn't put the fifth one. I'm sorry.